Well, this week and next, we will be spending our time in equipping hour talking about evangelism. Uh, That is a proclamation of good news of how sinners get declared righteous, how sinners get to go to heaven. This is the most important question that any human can answer. How do I, the sinner, be made right before a holy God? And it is the duty and the delight of believers who have been rescued to tell other sinners how to be rescued. So we're talking about evangelism this week and next. And uh, first, I want to give you the reason for evangelism. The reason for evangelism. There's uh, something of an abbreviated outline for you on the screen Uh, But the reason for evangelism first will be the ought and then the want. I'm going to give you the oughta, why we oughta share the gospel with people, and then why we want to share the gospel with people. Uh, Let's start with the ought, and I'd turn your attention to Matthew 28. This is a familiar text. It is the Great Commission. Jesus, before his ascension, assembles the eleven and says to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. Therefore, going, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And we've talked about this before. Jesus' instructions to the eleven can only be carried out if those eleven make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples to the ends of the earth, even to the end of the age. Turn over to Acts chapter 1. Here, after the ascension, we have similar words with an extra ingredient. Acts 1.8, Jesus says to his assembled disciples, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. Here we have the idea of disciple-making disciples being called witnesses. And witnesses who are empowered. That empowerment would come from the indwelling Holy Spirit. You see, the disciples who had been witness to the resurrected Christ would need more than experiential adrenaline to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, even to the end of the age. They would need supernatural power, the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit, who who would empower them to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. These then become imperatives for us, mandates for what it means to be disciples. We are disciples because the disciple making disciples made disciples who made disciples. And here we are and we have the gospel. And the task of disciple making discipling to the ends of the earth to the end of the age has not yet been completed. We are in a long line of those who have proclaimed the gospel and have believed the gospel becoming gospel proclaimers. And this is right and appropriate for God's people of all time to declare what he has done. Listen to Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to Yahweh, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. This frankly ought to be the impulse of God's people at all time. And for those of us who have been saved in Christ, uh, what could be a testimony personally of God's great work? besides that which he's done for us in Christ. Listen to Proverbs 11.30, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise wins souls. Uh, That is a significant aspect of wisdom for us. Just to think about people from an eternal perspective, to think about them beyond the material, beyond the external, beyond the temporal, and to think about the eternal destinies of all those who are around us. Listen to Jesus' words in Luke 12, 8. If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. That gets us even closer to the definition of someone who ends up in heaven, someone who is a genuine believer, is someone who confesses publicly of their loyalty to God, someone who confesses to others in this life that they know and love Christ. And then listen to Colossians chapter 4. This is Paul invoking the Colossian believers to pray for him and for his companions. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, Colossians 4.2, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. 
And then he gives some of the content of the prayers he would love for the Colossian believers to pray for him. Praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I've also been imprisoned. Pray that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Here, the mighty apostle Paul is asking for prayer in his own evangelistic endeavors. And then he says in verse 5, Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. All of that is the ought to, why we ought to be about gospel proclamation. But I want to remind us of the want to as well. It was in 1980 that Air Florida Flight 90, taking off in an ice storm from Washington Dulles, smashed into a bridge and then into the icy Potomac River. Nearly everyone on board was killed, including several people on the ground. There were six survivors. One of them was Priscilla Torado. Priscilla Torado was on board the plane and ended up in the icy Potomac River treading water. And when ropes were thrown to her, her fingers were so numb that she could not grab onto the rope so as to be rescued. Lenny Skutnik was a clerk in the Congressional Office of Budget and Management. And driving by, he kicked off his boots and jumped out of his truck and jumped into the Potomac River, where he grabbed Priscilla and held onto her while he himself was pulled to shore. If you think about the relationship between a Priscilla Torado and a Lenny Skutnik, don't you imagine that she would tell the story of her rescue when she was helpless and hopeless and would be dead? And some guy driving by jumped in and accomplished for her what she could not do. She would be forever grateful. Whatever, uh, whatever other uh, kind of things Lenny had ever done in life, maybe he was a, a no good, maybe he was a great guy, we don't know, I don't know. But that single act of selfless sacrifice on her behalf would become the basis of her gratitude all her life. Could you imagine someone walking up to Priscilla one day and saying, um, hey, tell me about Lenny. Yeah, I, I'm just kind of embarrassed. No, she would say, he jumped into the Potomac River and rescued me. There is an immense gratitude for us when we contemplate our own salvation that ought to just make us say, I want to declare the wonders of God. I want to tell everything that he has done for me. I was helpless and hopeless and dead and God saved me. Sometimes we think evangelism is really complicated. It ought not be very complicated. Tell the wonders of God. Tell about the grace of God in your life. Tell about how the gospel intersected your hopeless and helpless and spiritually dead situation and rescued you. What has Jesus done for you, friend? Open your mouth. That's evangelism. That's evangelism. The reason you and I are still on the earth, by the way, as a trophy of God's grace, is to put on display before a dying world everything God does in the gospel for sinners. You will soon leave the world of the dying, and you will go to your heavenly home. And when you get home, you will no longer be able to tell sinners how to be forgiven. You will no longer be able to boast of Christ in a dying world. You will no longer be able to give hope to the hopeless. That portion of the reason for your existence will be done. That can only be done here and now. Listen, Christian, our lives as trophies of God's saving gospel is to be heralds of that gospel, ambassadors of his grace, proclaimers of the excellencies of Christ. It's why you haven't been hit by a truck yet. It's why you're still on this earth. Let's talk about the method of evangelism. What is God's method for evangelism? There's only one. No, there's not. I'm going to give you a list of hundreds, maybe. I don't know. I'm going to tell you some of the things that I've been involved with. I'm going to tell you some of the things I've not done yet, but would like to. And maybe some of the, some of the ways people have done evangelism that I've only been an observer of. 
Street evangelism. How many of you have participated in street evangelism? I'm just going to go somewhere out in public and just try to start talking to people. That's hard. Man, a lot of you have done that. It's, it's thrilling, sort of emotionally exhilarating to do something scary, uh, initiate it, start it. I, I find that once you get a conversation started, it's easier to have the conversation, but starting the conversation is, is challenging. It's kind of like jumping out of an airplane. Um, getting up the nerve to actually jump is difficult, but once you're falling, I mean, what else are you going to do? You're just going to keep going. So, um, street evangelism. I've been involved in open air preaching. You know, that's the kind where you stand on a wooden crate and, and you have a sandwich board and a megaphone. I don't know how many of you have done that before, but you just start talking where there's a crowd and see if anybody will listen. And most people walk by and ignore you. Some sneer, some yell, uh, some interfere. And every once in a while, you get some questions and some comments. Uh, some of our uh, people here go to Mill Avenue. Uh, anybody currently involved in the Mill Avenue evangelism? I think that, is it Thursday nights? At what time do you guys meet? 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. Thursday nights at Mill Avenue. So you can go join the fellows down there and uh, engage in conversations with some people that are sober um, and then other people. And uh, that, is, that is a thrilling opportunity to just talk about Christ um, downtown Tempe. Uh, in the past, uh, some of the guys around here, and I've done this, have been involved in First Fridays, downtown Phoenix, a once-a-month extravaganza where the city just comes out, and you walk around and just start trying to gauge people in conversations. I've been involved in subway preaching uh, in the city of Chicago. That was an interesting one because you had a three-minute interval, interval between trains. So you get a platform full of people, and you just say something to get people's attention, and you start preaching the gospel, and you got three minutes. And then people get on their trains, the platform empties, the train unloads, and then the platform's full of a new audience. And in about an hour, you get a dozen or so preaching conversations with new crowds. Chairlift evangelism. I don't know if any of you have done that. Um, depending on the chairlift, you might get seven minutes. And you can have some interesting conversations. Uh, you're, you, you can actually, you, you know exactly when the conversation is going to end. You've got a captive audience because they're not leaving until the chairlift ends and they get off and they go about skiing. And, and so you can actually tell, okay, I've got eight more chairs to wrap this up. I've passed out tracks. By the way, we have uh, Grace Bible Church printed tracts in the office. If you want a handful of tracts, that is an explanation of the gospel on a card. And on the back has our church information. You can take some of those and hand those out when you get in a conversation with somebody. Uh, I've known people that have left tracts in various places. I would not recommend leaving a tract in place of a tip at a restaurant. That's a bad idea. Okay, Leave a tract with a really nice tip, that's different. Right, um, But people leave tracks in, in various places. I actually have met somebody who got saved picking up a tract in a restroom, in a public restroom, reading it and believing the gospel. Social media posts can be evangelistic highways. Many of you do that regularly and do that faithfully. I've done door-to-door -door evangelism in the neighborhood in which I've lived, uh, apartment complex, in which I've lived. Um, you can do door-to-door -door evangelism in your own neighborhood. Uh, we've done door-to-door -door evangelism around churches that I've been a part of. Um, currently here on Fridays at 10.30 a.m., there's a group of people. Uh, Vince Famusa, David Britton, and Daniel and Sarah Bruce uh, are the regulars, and then others of us have jumped in from time to time. 10.30 a.m. Fridays, if you want to join them for neighborhood evangelism, uh, we just go to the apartments right around here and just knock on doors. COVID's been an interest, had an interesting effect on people being home during the day. Lots of people are at home during the day. Now they may come to the door and say, I'm in a meeting, because they're working from home. But I've been surprised how many people we actually meet in our own neighborhoods going door to door and sharing the gospel. And some have come to church here on Sunday as a result of some of those conversations. You may have been involved in dorm-to-dorm -dorm evangelism on university campuses. Um, maybe you've hosted a dorm room Bible study. 
that's a, that's a great way to do evangelism. Get, get friends in the dorm, uh, people that don't know Christ. Hey, I'm going to do a Bible study. Do you want to come? See who shows up. I've been on uh, trips in foreign countries uh, with a handful of college students, one of them in particular to Russia, where every one of our college students had, a, had their own translator. So all of us were sort of gathering and then scattering throughout university campuses and in public squares and a number of different places and just sharing the gospel. And so in, in 15 or so college students, each with a translator, talking to a line of Russians who just wanted to talk to an American. Uh, that was exhausting because you'd have a 30-minute, hour-long conversation with somebody and there's a line of people waiting to talk to you personally. And that person leaves, next person steps up, and you just start all over again. All day long. That was exciting and exhausting. I've been involved in high school Bible clubs. So large public high schools where uh, you just get people together and say, hey, we're going to host a Bible study. You should come and people bring their friends and you try to share the gospel through that venue. Been involved in college campus ministries. Specifically, I was involved in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and we would walk around the, the campus and we would do evangelism. And then we try to have meetings where we get people together to share the gospel with them. I've been involved in sports outreaches. Uh, neighborhood people were invited to pick up games of basketball or volleyball with a gospel explanation sort of at halftime. We ran a college campus cookout event with the best gospel speaker we could find. Um, we grilled hot dogs and we invited people. And uh, then we had our speaker share the gospel. I've done abortion clinic, sidewalk prayer evangelism and counseling just trying to interact with people in that context uh, around gospel truth and giving comfort and talking about eternal life and praying. We've done homeless evangelism. Some of that happens here at this campus. Um, people walk up and they present a need and uh, we, we try to meet physical needs where we can. Um, we don't hand out money from the church, but we have some things uh, here on campus that we can hand out to meet some physical needs. And we try to make those gospel conversations every time somebody comes. Uh, in Chicago, I learned a, a really remarkable lesson. I, it was at a, a chapel, and they were telling us how to interact with panhandlers. The city of Chicago, uh, downtown where I went to school, there were, you met homeless people every single time you went out from campus and they would ask for things. And they would ask for uh, cash to get bus tokens or to get a burger or to uh, a train ticket or something else that they needed. And, and I, 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 felt, um, I felt profoundly the needs that were being presented. How can I meet all of these needs? And, and I got some really good advice that um, if you want to if you want to meet somebody's need and you want to carry some some uh, spare change, uh, some dollars in your pocket, that's a really good idea. That would be compassionate, intentional, thoughtful. But we were told be careful that you don't just hand out cash, because they were aware at that time in the city of Chicago what the cash was used for, and it was not used usually for the need presented. Carry the cash and go meet the need. If somebody's asking for a bus ticket, go with them to the bus station and buy them a bus ticket. Get them wherever they need to go. If someone's asking for a burger, go buy them a burger and sit down with them and share the gospel with them. Use the, the time walking with somebody and the time eating with somebody to proclaim the gospel. Um, and, and that was really good advice. That was a way to uh, be wise about giving, um, but also use those opportunities for uh, evangelistic encounters. Uh, I've taken several trips to homeless missions, um, LA mission and Nashville rescue mission in particular, where you go down and, and people are provided a, a free hot meal and a place to sleep for the night. If they will come listen to somebody talk to them for a little while. And so you get the opportunity to just go, okay, I'll talk to them for a little while. And the goal is to share the gospel. Um, and they provide various things that homeless people need. They meet those needs um, and they get to hear from God's word. Had an interesting opportunity at a deaf school to do evangelism. Um, not only was the, the school a school for the deaf, but it was also in Ukraine. And uh, so there, there were multiple translation issues. Uh, I, I and others would speak in English and then that was translated into Ukrainian and Russian and then to sign. 
Uh, that was an interesting encounter. I have no idea um, how that went. Um, nursing home preaching is a um, great opportunity as well. Uh, people can gather and they come to listen. Uh, there are uh, some in our body who are involved in um, uh, retirement home community preaching on Sunday afternoons. If you'd like to know more about that, go talk to Ashley Anderson. Uh, there are a number of men in our church who do that on a regular basis, um, opening God's word and making the, the gospel known to, to people in retirement homes. Um, you can be involved in nursing home service and visitation going from room to room and meeting with people. Sometimes that happens because you have a connection, a family friend or uh, um, a family member. Um, a really, really uh, enjoyable evangelism I've found is um, reading the Bible with an inquirer. If you get into a, a gospel conversation with somebody, uh, it, it's really delightful to ask them, hey, would you consider reading the Bible? Um, read through the Gospel of John, read through Romans, read through Leviticus, whatever, and we'll get together and talk about it. And, and that way their eyes are on God's word, your eyes are on the same passages, and you can walk through them with it. That is really compelling uh, as, a, as a method of evangelism or of a venue of evangelism because you recognize the, the power to give life is the word of God in the hands of the spirit of God uh, to draw out life. That is, um, I, I enjoy that. You can explain your own testimony at small group. Uh, there, there is at least one I know of in this church who became a believer because they heard someone else giving his testimony in our small group. Uh, that's a great way to proclaim the gospel. Being a pastor provides unique opportunities for gospel proclamation. Obviously, being in a pulpit and you get to preach and make the gospel clear. Uh, communion meditations, uh, preaching at weddings, preaching at funerals. Uh, those are all really uh, phenomenal opportunities to proclaim the gospel, uh, to speak at retreats or camps, to guest preach, to be in other churches, to be at conferences, uh, to be on Christian school campuses. Uh, speaking at, at Christian high schools or Christian college campus chapels. Uh, those are great gospel opportunities. You, you probably know this, and if you don't know, you need to know. Not every student at a Christian high school or a Christian college is born again. That may come as a shock. Um, they need to hear the gospel. Hospital visitation. Um, when you go to make a hospital visit, maybe it's someone you know, maybe you're brought along to encourage someone who you don't know. Um, there are some in our body who um, make a living visiting those in hospital, meeting people in their most difficult times, whether as a chaplain or a medical professional, um, and being able to speak truth into the lives of people who are suffering. That's a great gospel venue. Being a pastor means sometimes I get a call from an out-of-town friend who has an unbelieving family member where I live. Hey, will you call so-and-so? My uncle lives there. He really needs to go to church. That's a pretty regular phone call. It gives me an opportunity to reach out to somebody. Pastors have opportunities to, to write and to, to speak in various ways that make being a pastor uh, have some uh, unique opportunities to share the gospel. But I will tell you that sometimes being a pastor gets in the way of evangelism. A pickup basketball game um, where, where I would, uh, was, was a regular in several different seasons. And having gospel conversations, talking to people, trying to find out about them, uh, trying to speak truth and, and, and trying to get to the gospel, eventually somebody would say, oh, so what do you do for a living? Oh, <clears throat> I'm a... <clears throat> I'm a pastor. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pastor. <laughs> oh, I see. That's why you're talking to me about religious stuff. It's, it's his gig. That's how he makes his living. I get it. And I get written off like a Tupperware salesman, right? And, and, and the response is typically, dude, I appreciate the hustle, but thank you, I'm fine. Uh, it just seems like it's, it's part of, uh, you know, how I make my way in the world. And, and it gets dismissed. Sometimes I just like to be incognito. No, I, I'm just a sinner that got saved. I happen to be a pastor. But I'm telling you about Christ because you need him. There are a lot of venues to do gospel proclamation. Uh, weddings are great. 
particularly your own. Right? You have the opportunity to sort of orchestrate how the ceremony goes and, and what gets said and what scriptures get read. And uh, you, you have the heartbeat to let people that are coming to your own wedding to hear the gospel. And that's critical because your marriage is to be a reflection of the gospel. We'll talk about that as an evangelistic opportunity in a moment. But then there are different kinds of uh, engagements, uh, different kinds of um, speaking opportunities around weddings, wedding toasts and, and banquets and various family gatherings. Those are great opportunities to explain why you're getting married, what marriage is all about, what is it intended by God to picture. Your own marriage then becomes the living picture of Christ's love for his bride, the church, and a bride's devotion to her Savior. And so the way you live out your marriage becomes a platform for you to explain what marriage is. And by the way, the, the, the preordained, pre-eternal plan of God to save his people through the blood of Christ predates the first marriage. So that marriage becomes the picture of the thing that predates it. That's Paul's explanation in Ephesians 5. Think about your own memorial service. Uh, my father-in-law just uh, recently preached a memorial service for a, a dear godly woman who had sort of orchestrated how she wanted the service to go because she wanted people to understand the truth. Look, you can plan your own memorial service. Here's what I want people to know. Here's the songs I want them to hear. Here's the scriptures I want read. Here's who I want to have preach. And they've got to make the gospel clear. You can do that. You can plan that ahead of time. Perhaps even more than your own memorial service, thinking about your own homegoing. Um, what will people say when you're gone? How will you be remembered? That you are an ambassador of God's grace? a living trophy of the gospel that saved you and a, a herald of his love and truth. By the way, going to memorial services, often taking people to memorial services and then engaging with people at memorial services to talk about eternal things is good and right and biblical. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. Why? Because the living take it to heart. Funerals are better than parties. They make great gospel opportunities. If you're a teacher or a helper in Next Generation Ministries, thank you. You are proclaiming the gospel. You are teaching God's truth. You are building a foundation for giving a hearing to his word to the next generation of kiddos. You can be involved in things like vacation Bible school, backyard Bible clubs, you could be a taxi driver or an Uber driver. Uh, for a while, Omri was an Uber driver. So that while he was getting paid to take people places, he had a captive audience and could share the gospel. Similarly, you have a captive audience if you get an Uber. You sit in the back seat. And as long as the car's moving, <laughs> that guy's not getting away. Share the gospel with him share the gospel with taxi drivers, bus drivers. I love airplane rides. I like airplane evangelism. Uh, it, it may be going away some. Everybody puts their headphones on, tunes out, goes to sleep, don't want to talk to the person next to you. But sometimes you get somebody that's talkative and you may have an agenda of things you want to get done during this secluded time where you're in a chair and a seatbelt and books and you can, man, I can get so much work done. And then somebody says, hey, what you reading? Be thankful for the, for the divine interruption. Right? What, a, what a great opportunity to sit with somebody by a divine appointment or, you know, Delta Airlines scheduling, whoever assigns all the seats. Somebody arranged that. School assignments can be good evangelistic opportunities. You have to write papers, do presentations, give speeches, be on the debate team, whatever. Um, so you, you sort of get the assignment right and sneak the gospel in. I'm willing to take a, a shot at a lower grade to make the gospel clear to peers and to teachers. Family relationships, obviously, are gospel opportunities. I think these are tougher. In one sense, family relationships are a captive audience, right? Um, your mom still has to still be your mom, and your siblings still have to be your siblings, even if you offend them with the gospel. 
Sometimes family relationships are broken. Uh, Sometimes families get divided over gospel realities, but you love your family members. They are near and dear, and and they don't come and go like even the deepest friendships can. They, They are still always family. And so you long and you pray and you proclaim and you listen and you pray some more and you speak the truth. Uh, in my own family, um, some who, who were bold with the gospel with family members and rejected and stiff-armed were told by other well-meaning Christians, stop preaching. He doesn't want to hear it. And you know the great irony of those perhaps well-intentioned but missing the mark encouragements was that when my uncle was at his lowest, he didn't reach out to those nice Christians who didn't preach at him and bark at him and give him a hard time. He reached out to the one who had consistently, faithfully told him the gospel. And he said to my dad, Charlie, I need you to come up here and, and be a good brother. And will you bring your Bible? And so on the spot, my dad flew to Ohio and met with his brother. And for two days, sat at the dining room table. And they opened the scriptures together. To be rejected in evangelism probably means that you were heard. And it might mean you're the person that someone turns to when they know they need to hear. Family relationships are tough. There are many evangelistic venues I haven't tried yet. I've seen others do. Uh, military chaplaincies, first responder chaplaincies. Tom Angstead for years um, worked as a chaplain and cared for um, Tempe police. Um, had tremendous inroads for the gospel there. Sports chaplaincies, hospital chaplaincies. I've never tried a, a neighborhood investigative Bible study. You know, put up signs in your neighborhood and said, hey, uh, Friday nights at my house, uh, I'm going to have cookies and a Bible. Anybody that wants to come find out more about what the Bible's all about. I've known people that have done that. That would be really fun to try sometime. Uh, There's the bad joke method. Um, This probably was my dad's favorite. He'd be in a grocery store. uh, He'd be at a checkout line uh, just about anywhere and tell some bad joke. You know, there are two kinds of bad jokes. There are the ones that are just inherently bad. Then there are the good jokes that are just told so many times you can't stand them anymore. He used all of them, and he would tell a bad joke. I'd be there rolling my eyes, and within seconds, my dad is in a gospel conversation with somebody. I don't know how he did it. It was a, it was a gift. It was a skill. It was cultivated. Um, it was part of his personality. Um, that, that's one way to go about it. Awkward public encounters, you might call that one. There's another way to do evangelism. Translate the Bible and plant a church in another country. Uh, Some in this room are doing that. You can invite someone to church, and, and people who don't know Christ would be outsiders to the church, fundamentally, organizationally. Um, They would be an audience to the gathering of a supernaturally transformed people from all backgrounds, from all walks of life, unified together around the crucified Christ. And a visitor, an outsider, an unbeliever who comes to a church preaching the gospel, they, they will hear the gospel even though the church is for believers. They should see Christian love. They should hear God's truth. They should witness a symphony of unified voices giving expression through song of gratitude and worship to God flowing out of transformed lives. What they shouldn't see when they come is a venue that resembles where they came from in order to try to make them comfortable. Right? We, we love it when people who don't know Christ see what the church is, but they should see the church. Not the living room they just stepped out of, or the concert they just came from, or the worldly entertainment they need to abandon. They need to see something radically different, and and we're glad when they come. We're glad when they're here. Unbelievers should see in our gathering what they utterly lack. Cleansed consciences, hope, the vitality of real life, Christ in us. Now let me give you just a couple I've heard promoted as evangelism that I I don't know if I'd put in the category of legitimate evangelism. I smile at people in traffic. That's how I proclaim the good news. I've heard that. Um, Maybe you've heard the the sentiment, share the gospel always, sometimes use words. 
um, or if necessary, use words. No, it's always necessary. Heralding the gospel demands proclamation, uh, right? It, it, it demands words. We must speak. Let me just encourage you with that long list, as you think about it, uh, not one of those is the way to do evangelism. It, some of them have strengths, some of them have weaknesses. Uh, maybe we'll find all of you this week somewhere in the city of Phoenix with a sandwich board and a megaphone and a crate standing on top of it saying, repent for the, you know. Not all of them uh, have the same kinds of strengths fitted to your own personality situation in life. I wouldn't want you to feel guilty that you haven't done all of the things I just mentioned or that you've hardly done any of them. But what I would encourage you to is to participate in evangelism. You could do that by participating in some planned, scheduled, intentional evangelistic outing. But remember this, Christian, your earthly stay is an evangelistic outing. So moms at home with little ones. Think as an evangelist. In the workplace, on sports teams, as you go about your business in the world, or as you make intentional plans to go meet people that you don't know to proclaim Christ. I just want to encourage you to open your mouth. <clears throat> we'll be here uh, talking about this for two weeks. I'm not sure how long we'll get here in the notes, but at 9.45, that's six minutes from now, I'm just going to open to questions. Uh, Denny has a microphone, and so if there's a question in your mind, um, we'll take that, and, uh, and we'll do that here in about six minutes. Let me talk a little bit about the content of evangelism. Uh, what should be the content of evangelism? You may have used a, a number of various ways to make the gospel clear. Uh, perhaps a, a Roman's road, you think about some key verses in Romans, Romans 3.23, 6.23, 10.13. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Wages of sin is death. You have to believe in Christ. No one is ashamed who believes in him. Maybe if you've, you've used the Ten Commandments to, to put in front of somebody and then uh, remind them that they've failed and they need Christ. Um, perhaps you've uh, used your own story, your own testimony, uh, your own word about what God has done in your own life. By the way, I, I, I really like that. To incorporate gospel truth with your own life story. We'll hear four of those this morning in, in, in our baptism service. I really like that way of, of talking about the gospel, not as an abstract thing, but that gospel, which God does, which is objectively true outside of me, actually infiltrated my life and radically transformed me. I want to tell you about it. Right? That's the Priscilla Torado story. I had the opportunity in Nashville, which would be the buckle of the Bible belt. I had to learn uh, when we left California. Well, actually, when I left California in high school to move to Texas, <coughs> excuse me, and then again, moving from Southern California to Nashville. The mode of evangelism changed. In Southern California, you shared the gospel with people who didn't think they were Christians. In Nashville and in Texas, you, you began to share the gospel with people who were convinced they were Christians, and the, the method was convince them that they're not a Christian and then tell them about Christ. Because everybody went to church, and you asked people in Nashville, uh, how does somebody get to heaven? Uh, what is the, right? oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And then you ask them, what does that mean? And they have no idea, <laughs> but they've got the verbiage. It's cultural. I had the opportunity to meet a 16-year-old kid in Nashville one time. And he had only ever heard the word Jesus as a swear word. Did not know it was a person. Did not know he was in the Bible. And, and this was a, a kid in a cosmopolitan city um, that had just been insulated. And I said, hey, I, I can't remember uh, how or where I met him, but I had some time on my hands. I said, uh, hey, I'd love to tell you about Jesus. Sure, what's that? Um, and then I said, how much time do you have? Oh, I'm not doing anything this afternoon. And I spent four hours with him. And, and I said, okay, he doesn't know anything. If I just say, um, you're a sinner, God's holy, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and you need to repent and believe. Kind of a four-point classical outline. 
I'm not sure it had context to sit with him. So I backed up. I, I, I had a Bible, gave him a Bible, and we went to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I acted like he knew nothing of the Bible, which actually turned out to be true. He knew nothing. And it just started in Genesis. And, and went through the creation and Adam and Eve and their perfection and r- relationship to God. And then uh, the fall in Genesis 3 and then Genesis 3.15, the promise of a seed. And then uh, Eve, Eve thinking that um, Cain might be the seed promise fulfillment. But he killed his brother. Who is it going to be? Is it going to be Seth? And just walk through Old Testament chronology with the seed promise in view, working through Old Testament history and the sacrificial system, uh, working through the, the, the kings and then the prophets and the successive disappointments of everyone who came in a seed line and was not the seed. And then to John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we talked about lambs and sin and God and sacrifice and substitution. And it was just a remarkable opportunity to do with this kid in Nashville what Zach can and the team are doing in Papua New Guinea with people who don't know the Bible, haven't known Christ. If you ever get the opportunity to do that, I would encourage it. I wanted for years to have the opportunity to ask a practicing Hebrew reading Jew, their take on Isaiah 53. And when it was, when we were working through uh, Isaiah 40 to 48 here on Sunday mornings, I had a Hebrew text of Isaiah open on a plane and the lady sitting next to me said, Hey, is that Hebrew? I said, do you know Hebrew? I said, uh, uh, she said, yes, I, I studied in Hebrew school. Oh, um, do you still go to synagogue? Yeah. Practicing Jew. Have you ever read this? Do you know what this is? This is Isaiah. No, we weren't allowed to read the prophets. You weren't allowed to read the prophets. Why is that? Oh, we just read Torah. Oh, um, do you want to read this? My Hebrew is a little rusty. So we went English and Hebrew side by side. I didn't tell her what Isaiah 53 was about. I didn't tell her I was a Christian. It was just, is that Hebrew? Yeah, okay, we're off. Here we go. So here's Isaiah 53, Hebrew and English text. And she's reading it out loud to me on the plane. And when she finished, I said, who is this about? And she said, oh, it's Jesus. I know it's Jesus. Why weren't we allowed to read the prophets? This is clear. Why why didn't they let us read this? And we just talked about Christ the rest of the time. So if you ever meet somebody who's uh, a practicing Jew, ask them to read Isaiah 53. Ask them what they think about it. All right, it's 9.45. I'm going to pause right there. Uh, We'll pick up the rest next week. Unless you have no questions, then I'll just keep going in my notes. Um, What questions do you have about evangelism? Denny, Matt Schneider's got one back there. And then Diana Allen. We'll go in that order. I saw one, two. Frank just rubbed his head. He's number three. Hey, Smith. Can you help us think through casting our pearls before swine? Don't. <laughs> you share the gospel multiple times. They're not listening. What do you do? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there is a time to leave. There is a time to cease a conversation. Um, I, I've interacted with people who were drunk or hostile or drunk and hostile. Um, there, there's, a, there's a pearl and swine principle in there somewhere in the mud. Um, I'm not sure what a clear line of demarcation is, but I would appeal to Monica. Monica was Augustine's mother who shared the gospel with him and prayed for him for 30 years and with her husband, who was a degenerate. Um, of course, Augustine came to faith in his early 30s. Um, and then his father came to faith on his deathbed. So I would just say there are relationships God puts in your life. Be relentless. Um, I wouldn't call someone a pig too quick. That's just a thought. I, there, there is wisdom case by case. There are scenarios to walk away from. But, all right, uh, Diana. 
What role does apologetics have with gospel sharing? Great. That's next week. I'll give you, I'll give you the summary here. Um, apologetics gets way too complicated. Um, it, you, I, I have a series of questions we'll walk through next week. What if I meet somebody that's smarter than me? What if I meet somebody who doesn't believe the Bible? What if I meet somebody? What if I meet all that kind of stuff? Um, take Martin Luther's advice when pressed. How do you defend the Bible? How do you know it's God's word? The Bible needs no defense. It's like a lion. Just let it off its leash. It'll take care of itself. So the word of God is the power of God to do the things you and I could never do. If we thought for one moment that I could outsmart the smart person who's asking me challenging questions, I've missed the whole point of what evangelism is, right? We're raising the dead by supernatural power through the means of faulty, frail, feeble human communication. So more on that next week. Frank, by the way, if you want homework for next week, read Pratt's Every Thought Captive. Right? You can read a thousand and thousand and thousand pages on apologetics that'll get philosophical and confusing. But you read Pratt boiled it down to less than 100 pages. Every thought captive. <clears throat> All right, Michaela. So I was wondering, when you're having a conversation with someone sharing the gospel who has a lot of spiritual thoughts and opinions and just rattling off a lot that's just really wrong and bad to think, how, what type of things do you think through based on, like, to tell yourself, I can just be silent on this one. I don't need to get into it. It's okay that they don't, that they know that that's wrong. And what kind of things are you like, oh, I have to correct this now. Mm -hmm. And if you feel like you have to correct it now, do you have any, like, suggestions on how to do it with um, gentleness? It's <laughs> a great question, Michaela. So, and it's an interesting scenario, right? If, if somebody monologues for three minutes and you're like, there's 13 errors in what they just said, which ones will I address? How will I go about it? Am I going to get into this combative uh, situation? Uh, which ones are most important? How do I turn all of these questions to gospel? How do I be gentle the whole time? I would say case by case personality, everybody's going to deal with that a little bit differently. But if you sin in the conversation, your conversation is not seasoned with grace. That's going to be problematic. Um, but I'll just tell you what I love. I love asking the question when somebody speaks error. Tell me more about that. Why do you believe that? Um, you just said that blue equals orange. Man, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, where did you get that information? Um, what's your authority for that fact? Um, tell me more about that. What are the implications of blue being orange? I just find that very interesting. I, <clears throat> I personally love to draw somebody out in that because I know something. I know a couple of things. We'll get into this next week about what an unbeliever knows when you're talking. Um, you need to know that as feeble as you think you might be in an evangelistic encounter, you have significant allies. One is the whole universe around you, Psalm 19 and Romans 1. The other is what's internal to the unbeliever you're talking to. They know God exists, and you know that they know that God exists. God told you that they believe in God. That's why you know there's no such thing as an atheist. Right? We'll get to that next week. But you also have the ally in them of the conscience, um, and eventually they may not, you may not realize it's an ally yet, but you have the ally of what is for them a broken and inconsistent worldview. There is only one thoroughly consistent worldview and it is God's worldview. There is only one bias that actually accords with truth and it's God's bias. If I'm armed with that knowledge, I can say what the Psalm writer said in Psalm 119, I can be wiser than all my teachers because I love your law. Right? If you know God's word, you also know that whatever worldview they have, whatever errors they spout, will break down. And you can get to that by asking enough questions. If you just ask the why question, where'd you get that? How do you know that? Um, eventually, it leads to the circular reasoning that sometimes Christians get accused of. Wait, why do you know the gospel's true? Well, because the Bible said so. How do you know the Bible's true? Because the gospel saved me and the God who saved me wrote this book and he told me that it's true. Yeah, that's circular reasoning. Have you, ever, have you ever heard that argument, faced that argument, been afraid of that argument? Just know that the other guys got circular reasoning too. His circle's just not as good. Yours is grounded on absolute authority and absolute truth on the person and work of Jesus Christ who is the truth. And you need, no fear, need not fear that circular argument. 
It just means we're dependent epistemologists. How we know what we know means we're rightly related to our maker who made and sustains all things. Right? The other guy has removed himself out from under God and God's way of knowledge has become his own knower in and of himself. And he might say, oh, I'm not circular reasoning. I believe in linear, logical thinking. Well, why do you believe that blue is orange? Because my science teacher told me so. Well, why did your science teacher told you so? Because the scientific method. Wait, have you ever read the scientific method? Is that what that says? By the way, who made scientific method king? Did you decide that that's how you decide truth? And eventually the circle comes back around to self. Not the tight circle of God and his truth, which is outside of me. I'm dependent on. But the circle of self. I become my own authority. I decide truth. So I just like to press the question. Oh, why do you think that? Tell me more. Give a, give a man enough rope, he'll hang himself in an argument. Right? That's a metaphor. <clears throat> All right. Who else? <laughs> Sorry. I'm scared, Tom. What are you going to ask me? We'll get it on the microphone so it makes the recording. Or you could ask and then I can interpret it. And my interpretation will be on the recording. Oh, man. Uh, okay, let's say you're speaking with a Jehovah's Witness. And they claim to read the Bible as we do. Um, their Bible is a little different, but they will read the King James Version with you. So there are so many rabbit trails and subjects that because they love to say, yeah, but, and they'll go somewhere else. So of all the different subjects that surround Christ, what would be the number one subject you would hit on and stick to that? Two things for you, Tom. Are you reading my notes? Here, here's the ne literally the next question of my notes. What if they're part of a cult and they use Bible verses? We, we arranged this beforehand. Good job, Tom. Um, you also connected rabbit trail and yibbit. I like that. It was like ribbit. I, I see what you did there. Yibbit. Yeah. Yibbit theology. <clears throat> Yeah, what do you do when you interact with somebody who uses the Bible? Maybe they use Bible verses you're not familiar with. Maybe they're giving explanations you can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with. Uh, and, and the Jehovah's Witnesses are, are notorious for this because they will go to a Bible verse um, and they'll jump to another and jump to another and jump to another before you can actually land in the one and ask them questions about the one. But I would encourage you, particularly with Jehovah's Witness, oh, you quoted a Bible verse, take me there, explain it to me in its context. Is that what that verse means? How do you know that's what that verse means? You can press them. They won't stay long, typically. But generically, let's just say some, it, not necessarily Jehovah's Witness, because they're, they're sort of trained to do that, to do hopscotch from place to place to place, just to keep you um, kind of behind where they're arguing. Um, background on that is, know your Bible. Um, if, if you're not blackballed by the JWs and they come to your door more than once, um, go to the passages that they said they wanted you to turn to, go study them and be ready for the next time. Right? So when they, when they, uh, they quote John, the gospel of John and say, see, Jesus said, didn't I say you're all gods? Uh, then the next time they come, you know that Jesus is quoting Psalm 82 and you'll go back there and you'll understand what Jesus is doing there in that context that actually God is in their midst judging the unjust rulers. Uh, that's a trap door for JWs, but it just means listen to their questions, go to their texts. And you know that the Bible's true and the Bible will win and it'll even defeat their, you know, misuse of it. But there's something even more important, even if you don't have uh, the, the wherewithal to understand how they're misusing a text, you know, believer, that your sins are forgiven and you know that you know Christ. You are a sheep and you hear his voice and you love him and he loves you. Um, you have the guarantee of eternal life. No cult member would even claim to have the guarantee of eternal life. Why? Because they're in a false religious system where eternal life has to be earned and they've got to do and do and do and do. And showing up at your door is one of the do's they have to do and they still haven't done it all yet. And so you can ask any cult member at your door, anybody with a false religious system, anybody spouting Bible verses, the fundamental and simple question, are you going to heaven? Oh, I, I hope so. Wait, you hope so? You don't know? And you're at my door and you've been going to my neighbor's doors and telling them about something you don't know anything about? 
And this is life and death and eternity? How dare you? <laughs> you, know, you don't have to use my words on that, but. I, I, Tom, hold, hold their feet to the scriptural fire. They want to go to a passage? Go to the passage and keep them there because they're getting it wrong. But even still, you know you have the upper hand in terms of um, the truth has gripped you and has given you life and real hope, not wishful thinking. And, and they just have the sorry wishful thinking of maybe I've done enough to maybe get there. Tragic. And that's what you're selling? All right, who else? Two-minute question. Sorry, Frank, uh, 30-second question. Go ahead. Uh, have you had any missed opportunities or situations that you regret where you walked away from? Two questions out of that. What did you learn, and how did you handle that, or at least work through that in your heart? I don't think I've learned. Um, look, I, yes, I walk away from evangelistic opportunities regularly. And, and what a shame that will be in eternity. Um, what have I learned? That I'm scared. <laughs> that I'm ungrateful. That I don't love people like I should. That I'm not thinking about them through the lens of eternity. Um, yeah, I've walked away from far too many. Yeah. Just a, just a note on, on um, being scared. <clears throat> um, it is scary to start a conversation with somebody about eternal things. It's different than starting a conversation because you notice they had a bumper sticker, the same professional sports team that you happen to like. Hey, you're a Cubs fan, whatever. Um, that's easy to talk about. Um, but, but that doesn't indict the soul. That doesn't put somebody on the defensive. Unless they're a White Sox fan. That doesn't... That doesn't cause problems in a relationship. And the gospel does. It's a sword that divides. Look, who wants to do that? Who wants to be a pariah? Who wants to put a sword between potential friendships? Who wants to break up a Thanksgiving dinner with family? It is scary. It is scary. Um, and this is one of the things we'll get to next week. But um, one, of the, one of the great principles of evangelism is prayer. That's the hidden side of evangelism. Pray. Pray that God would give you gratitude that spills out. Um, worship that overflows in every relationship and every opportunity you have. Um, and then pray specifically for opportunities. And I find that when I pray for opportunities, they somehow appear throughout the day. Sometimes that is a direct answer to prayer because God provided an opportunity in answer to prayer. Sometimes it is, oh, my eyes were open in ways that God had been providing opportunities for me all along that I'd been ignoring, been distracted from, been avoiding. Um, but prayer is a matter of seeing opportunities, God granting opportunities, and then giving courage. I read earlier from Colossians, um, Paul the apostle was not above praying for opportunities, asking others to pray for opportunities, even asking others to pray that God would give Paul courage so that he would speak as he ought. And we can do the same for one another. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you. Uh, such trite words to say in response to our salvation. Um, we mean it. We want to mean it more. And we want to mean it with our lives and our lips. God, use us this week as we scatter would you see fit to equip the saints even this morning as we hear your gospel again, as we see it in the lives of those who have been transformed by it, as we get equipped by your word, uh, scatter us to our cul-de-sacs and cubicles, to our sports teams and families and friends to make your name known, to speak of the excellencies of Christ with all of our breath as long as we live in his name. Amen.